Okay, so uh, welcome everyone to the next part of the day. We're sorry we're a little behind in schedule here, so I'll, I'll be quite brief. Uh, my name's Tom from Lamazoko, Australia, and I'm really excited to introduce our next speaker today. Uh, it's actually uh, two years for me uh, with Mazoko, and my first day was two years ago at Out of the Box. And uh, the highlight for me by far was um, listening to our next guest speaker. Um, it's, I thought I knew a lot in coffee, and then to actually hear this next guest speaker just refueled my, my passion uh, and, and my reason for being in coffee. And this morning we heard a lot about um, the, the importance of why, if you enter the Peter Docker talk. And Dr. Schilling's why is very, very obvious and um, quite inspiring. So we're talking uh, partnerships with Mazoko and our partners with our roasters and our, and our distributors. Uh, Dr. Schilling's partnerships are across countries and governments. And it's, uh, it's quite incredible to, to hear some of his stories. Uh, he's just returned from Nairobi recently this week. And uh, Tim, you um, just had some amazing words last time. We talked uh, a lot. It was a really interactive session. So please um, get your coffee buzz on and, and, and talk to Tim. I'm sure he'd love to hear your questions at the end. And uh, remember last time we talked a lot on Ethiopia, um, some of the struggles there. But uh, to give you an example uh, of what Dr. Schilling might do in the world is he, he really converts uh, some of a lot of our theories and a lot of our talk into practicality. So Tim uh, will bring together governments and countries to make action. An example of that is the, the 2012 uh, coffee leaf rust, which is something I'm sure we're all familiar with. And uh, Tim was the one to pull together the first world summit for coffee leaf rust and actually got some action got a $5 million grant happening from uh, USAID and made practical solutions, particularly in South America, for coffee leaf rust. So it's, it's about action with, uh, with Tim, and uh, his organisation is quite incredible. So it's my honour today to introduce Dr Tim Schilling, and I'm really excited to hear your talk today. Tim. Thanks, uh, Tom. Uh, yeah, I'm going to change gears a little bit from uh, our last presentation, which was uh, very interesting. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, coffee and genetics and coffee quality and the development of a new coffee evaluation, quality evaluation tool called the coffee lexicon. It might not look like I'm talking about that in the beginning, but that's what I'm going to be talking about. So uh, thanks for the great uh, in introduction. Um, at, at WCR, we, we focus uh, on solutions to the main coffee production constraints to farm profitability and productivity through agricultural research. Uh, what are those constraints? Well, the big one, obviously, is climate change and, as Tom mentioned, rust, uh, insects, and, of course, all the other biological and environmental threats uh, that we have in coffee. If we don't do something today, with climate change, we could have a reduction in total global coffee production as much as 50% by 2050. So these things are, uh, are, are, are real. Um, our approach and our focus is through coffee genetics. We're breeding new and better varieties. We're changing the plant. We're changing the plant through genetics so that it can adapt to the new climates, so that they can resist the rust diseases and insects and the other uh, challenges of, of this 21st century. In fact, all the varieties being used today um, are, they will be very soon uh, outdated. Uh, I, what I know every time I mention uh, coffee and genetics, um, and, and breeding, the first thing people think of is uh, Franken coffee, is uh, genetically modifying coffee. But this is not that. We are not uh, uh, doing anything regarding genetic engineering. We can do this kind of work that I'm be talking about here through classical breeding methods, but utilizing all the advances that have occurred in DNA science from all the other crops and species that have been worked on. So 
um, they're, 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 and we can, we can get these new varieties without utilizing uh, genetic engineering. Now, the, uh, the one ingredient we do need, however, in coffee breeding is genetic diversity. Genetic diversity, we have to have uh, genetic variability in order to make any kind of progress. Obviously, if you have um, um, a bunch of corn plants that are all, you know, 10 inches tall, and, you're, um, and what you're trying to do is breed corn plants that are 10 feet tall, you're not going to make any progress. You know, you, you've got to have variability. You've got to have the ability uh, in the genetics, in the genes of the plant, uh, in order to uh, make progress, in order to hit those, uh, those targets. Unfortunately, uh, in coffee, uh, we have just completed the biggest study ever in genetic diversity in the Arabica coffee species, and we found that the Arabica species just does not have the genetic diversity that is necessary to take us through the challenges of climate change and everything else that the 21st century is going to be throwing at us. Uh, it's just, uh, if you look at this graph here, you can see that out of the whole coffee genome, this is everything genetic with co Arabica coffee, 98.8% is genetically similar, leaving less than 2% of wiggle room to do the kind of uh, breeding and genetics work we're going to have to do to face the problems of the 21st century. Uh, the other thing that means is that we've got to go outside of the Arabica coffee species to get that genetic diversity to face the kind of problems that we're dealing with already today, but we're going to be dealing a lot more with later. So the obvious candidate, it's not the only one, is Robusta coffee. And as you know, uh, Robusta has got a bad reputation for its poor quality traits. That's not the only thing. They do have some good quality traits, but they are uh, largely poor quality. So the, 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 the real challenge for us at WCR is to take the greatest quality characteristics from the Arabica species and combine them with the great agronomic characteristics like climate resiliency, high productivity, disease resistance from the robusta species, and do that all without bringing over the bad quality traits of robusta coffee. So that's, that's the challenge. The problem is that when we're crossing Arabica by Rose, uh, Robusta, we, we, we keep all those um, uh, quality traits of Arabica and prevent the bad quality genes of, uh, of Robusta getting into the final variety. In order to do that, because we're focusing on coffee quality here, uh, it means that we have to measure coffee quality. We have to measure the quality of the parents and of the progeny of these crosses in order to advance the good stuff and to leave the bad stuff behind. As I'm sure everyone knows, Lord Kelvin back in 1860, these guys always said a lot of things uh, back in the 1800s th that we, we, we kind of look at today and say, wow, that was really amazing thinking. But he, he said, you know, you can't improve something if you can't measure it. That's a basic tenet of science. So in order to improve coffee quality, we have to be able to measure it. And that is what led us at WCR to start looking for a surefire method of measuring coffee quality so that we can indeed transfer the good traits of other coffee species like uh, Robusta into the high quality Arabica species. Well, you're probably thinking, uh, gee, well, we know how to measure coffee quality. You know, we've been evaluating it. There's the Cup of Excellence. There's SCAA. Falcon Coffee is, uh, is doing it right behind that curtain. You know, I mean, there's, we know how to do it. Well, uh, these methods are good for making coffee buying decisions and maybe for, uh, you know, like 
coffee competitions, but when you try to use them in science, they just, they, they, they just don't hold up. There's too much variability. And uh, to, uh, to show you a little bit of what I mean here, I, you know, when I was in Rwanda, uh, working in Rwanda, I was doing a lot of uh, experiments on coffee cup quality. So I'd look at all different kinds of things and, and on, on the effect, uh, the effects of those things on coffee cup quality. Like here's one, um, I remember doing the effect of fermentation time on the cup quality. And I was using SCAA standard methods. And uh, we had international panels as well as national panels doing this kind of uh, the cupping here. But as you can see here, wow, you know, as, as uh, you uh, increase the fermentation time, we're getting an increase in cup quality. Well, the problem is, is that NS down there, it means not significant. When you run the statistical analysis for most of these experiments where we were testing uh, for cup quality, the effect of stuff on cup quality, we got the same thing. Not significant. Not significant. It means that there's just so much variability around each one of those points on this graph that you can't separate them. You can't be sure about it. Uh, I, I'm going to borrow something from uh, uh, one of our colleagues, Lindsay Bolger, here to kind of bring this uh, uh, this, this concept of what we're looking for in the, the world of color and uh, the fact that we need this surefire method that allows us to differentiate coffee qualities. But the method has to be repeatable, it's got to be discriminatory, and it's got to be precise. So uh, in describing color, I think we can see it much easier. Uh, you know, because we have the benefit of these primary color cues, uh, red, yellow, and blue, and they can kind of help describe and identify, for example, you know, like the redness of a cherry or the yellowness of a lemon or the blue of a blueberry. But then what about this blue? I mean, you know, what, what blue is it that we're really talking about? Is it, the, is it the first one, the second one, or the third one? You know, so this is, this is where we are in coffee. Like, we, we need to know exactly what blue it is. So if I'm breeding blueberries and I want exactly that first blue that you see on your left, I've got to be able to, you know, distinguish that completely. It's got to be completely a discriminate way of doing it. I have to have a number that represents that so that I can statistically treat it. Well, you know, fortunately for those guys working in color, they've done that. You know, they've got this uh, uh, Pantone color matching system. So, like, uh, every one of those little panels you see there has a number attached to it. And as a result, somebody working in design or paint in Japan can have exactly the same color as one working in Seattle or Milan or, or anywhere, for that matter designers, you know, so this, this system is utilized in governments and uh, uh, art. E everyone uses this particular system uh, when they are working with color because it's a standard. It's a standard. You can actually communicate the exact same thing over countries, over cultures, over everything. And that's the kind of um, coffee quality evaluation system that we need in science in order to make progress at not only keeping the great quality traits we have already, but in expanding them. The, the thing is, though, that, you know, it, color is simple. You know, it's just, it's kind of like uh, two-dimensional. In, 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 in the world of uh, taste, you know, we've got to consider the cheriness of that cherry, not just the red of it, you know, that's, that's easy. We have to know the lemonness of that lemon, not just the yellow of it, and the blue Ness of, I mean, the, the blueberry ness of the blueberry. And you, you say, well, gee, maybe, you know, don't we have something like that in coffee too? Like this famous uh, flavor wheel? There's a flavor wheel right back again at that Falcon um, uh, display in the back from counterculture. Same thing. You know, these, these wheels are great for uh, kind of explaining uh, uh, coffee flavors and, and aromas, how you can go from like uh, sugar browning and how the sugar browning can, uh, that attrib that can be uh, taken into finer attributes like uh, uh, caramel or toast or something like that. So they're great at explaining and educating um, and they stop 
short when you need to use them for uh, scientific purposes. But they're so great that, you know, they're every, every product pretty much has one. Like here's one for wine. They've got them for cheese. Uh, they have them for chocolate. And just recently, they came up with this one for marijuana. So, you know, we're all happy about that, but they don't, uh, they still don't uh, give us what we need in science. So while they serve as a great method for organizing, you know, the flavors on that wheel and like I was explaining the sugar brownie thing, they just don't, uh, they just don't meet it. They don't provide that repeatability. You know, if you're talking about the blueberry-ness, you know, well, maybe somebody in Japan has, has got a completely different flavor. I mean, there's no standardization. So that's missing. So, you know, this is our problem in science. We have to have something that is repeatable, discriminatory, and precise. And so, what do you do, you know, when you can't figure out anything to do and you're in science? You call these guys that have got white coats and uh, they work in a laboratory around these kind of tables. And this is where we went to figure out how to do coffee quality evaluations in a precise, repeatable, and discriminatory manner. So WCR, we've worked for two years now with Kansas State and Texas A&M University sensory scientists to produce this first coffee lexicon, which is like the closest thing you can get in taste and aroma to that color Pantone thing I just so showed you a minute ago. Now these people, these are professional tasters. They're true sniffing, smelling, and tasting. They're like cyborgs. They're cyborgs. They're, like, they're, they're, they're trained to do this. They've, they've, uh, they've done lexicons on everything from uh, you know, underarm um, odor to uh, baby diapers to beer to peanuts to rice. They've, they've done it all. Uh, they've done lexicons you know, for, for these things. So they, they're very, they're, they know what they're doing. They're, they're pro. And um, what they did, actually, how we went about it was like this. They, ba we basically brought in about 200 different coffees, and they came from different, uh, like for SCAA uh, sent some, a lot of different coffee companies uh, uh, sent them. And uh, each, each coffee was described separately by each member of a, of a six-member panel, all right? Uh, and the description... At the end of each of the of each attribute, basically, had to be uh, agreed upon by all the panel members. So they did that for every taste, and for every one of the 108 aromas and tastes that they detected at the end of every one of those 200 coffees that they were uh, given. And it took them over a year to do so. They didn't just stop at what it was, all right, but also the how much. So not just that, okay, this is cherry, but what intensity is it? How much cherry is it? Is it a one on a 10 scale or is it a five? You know, that kind of thing. So that's, that's how the uh, lexicon was put together. And uh, uh, at the end of the day, you know, here's, you know, like the, a, a shot of uh, <laughs> the final product was this draft lexicon. Uh, so you... Uh, so you can see that for each of the 108 uh, um, attributes, that in this, if you could, maybe if you could see it better, you really can't, but um, they, they've got a definition, all right, for each of the attributes or terms. And each of those attributes also has a reference. They've identified a reference or a product that everybody can agree on to go back to, to assure them that this is exactly what we're talking about. This is the flavor. This is the cherry, you know. And for each of the references, they even went so far as to develop the recipes so that you could make the same references and, have, and be able to talk to people about coffees uh, in, in a very assured, uh, repeatable, uh, and accurate manner. Well... So let's say, for example, uh, we're cupping uh, coffees and, 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 and we feel like there's something like uh, we get a blueberry note, all right? Uh, you know, first, you know, like we have the description of a blueberry, the blueberry note, which is slightly dark, fruity, sweet, a little sour, musty, dusty, with floral aromatics 
that are usually associated with, of course, blueberries. Um, and so if we doubt that uh, it's a blueberry or have disagreement, we have this reference that we can go back to. In this case, the reference is a can of, uh, I'll just show it to you, a can of Oregon uh, blueberries that you get in the uh, store. So what, what, we've, uh, what they've done here is say, okay, this is our reference. When we're talking about blueberry and coffee, this is what we're going to use to judge it by. This is the thing we're going to use as a standardization. And how do we do that? And they tell you how to do it. You take a cognac snifter, for example. You put in one teaspoon of that blueberry juice from this can, and that is blueberry aroma at 6.5. And then, uh, if you want the, if you're getting blueberry taste, you have the actual blueberries themselves into a little bitty cup, and you can actually taste them, and so you can compare them. And that taste is at, with these blueberries is at an intensity of six. So that's uh, that's what it's about. And um, I got to, you know, say that, you know, all right, you're probably looking, a lot of you are going, whoa, man, Oregon blueberries in a can? Well, you know, you're right. We, this, we did this in the U.S., so everything's going to be a little bit uh, U.S.-centric. It's not that every reference is so American-centric, but because it was the U.S., and these are people and scientists work in the U.S., we started, we had to start somewhere. So that's where it's, we are going forward and standardizing the, the references for Europe and then with Japan. So that's going to happen too. So right now we've got a, a draft lexicon for uh, basically for, for, well, it's not just for the states because only a few of the references actually are so American-centric. Uh, let's see. Now, when we, you know, it's one thing to work with scientists, right? So, I mean, and that, that's great. But, um, you know, if you're not, you know, World Coffee Research, we are uh, owned, basically, uh, by the coffee industry. We are the coffee industry. We're funded by the coffee industry, and we're driven by the coffee industry. So we, we're not just going to work in a laboratory and then come out and say something. No. So we knew that this process had to take place with the industry. So as soon as the draft was ready, the draft lexicon, after those 200 coffees were uh, done, we brought in a panel of uh, about 20 industry uh, experts or you know, people that have been buying and, and cupping coffee with reputations for a long, long time to come in and take the lexicon out for a drive around the block, spin it. And, you know, this, this picture I took <laughs> from the first day. And you can see that these guys are going like, yeah, right. A, a, a group of university technicians in white coats are going to tell me uh, about coffee quality, something I've been working on my whole life. That's what I was feeling in the room. Um, but, you know, after working with the lexicon, where they were sniffing and smelling and tasting, it all began to make sense. And at the end of the day, the, this industry group kind of approved uh, the lexicon as indeed a precise and very useful method to describe and discriminate among coffees. In fact, the SCAA is now using this lexicon, the attributes in the lexicon, to, to develop a more advanced flavor wheel and replacing this flavor wheel that we all know and, and, and love and I've seen it a million times no matter where I go. So um, that's, that's one thing that's happening. Um, I um, basically at, at the end of this, but I wanted to um, say that we will be publishing this uh, lexicon early next month and you'll be able to download it from our webpage, worldcoffeeresearch.org. And I think that, you know, uh, roasting companies will be able to utilize this uh, lexicon to better calibrate their cupping teams. I think it all can be used to describe coffee more accurately on their descriptions, that kind of thing. And as well as identify key attributes uh, better and more consistently. And obviously, that would fit in well with formulations uh, for, example, uh, espresso blends. And uh, that brings me to this point here is the fact that uh, in talking about espresso, I, I, I just want to mention the fact that 
Uh, each sample of, the, of all those 200 coffees that we tested, uh, evaluated, was prepared by both a drip method and an espresso uh, extraction method. And because La Marazocco, as we all know, is such a forward-thinking and, and moving company, and they also understand the need for this kind of research, they not only support the research itself, but they also donated a GS3 machine to the laboratory at Kansas State. And then Tim O'Connor from Pacific uh, Espresso in California, also of La Marazocco, came out and trained the science barista. So I want to reach out uh, to La Marazocco and, and give them a big uh, thanks for uh, participating and supporting WCR. But before uh, we, we move on, let me just, let me just finally get to uh, the, the, the real point of this. And that is, we created the lexicon not for making new flavor wheels or, and stuff like that. That was not what it was created for. It was created for uh, so that we could better face the challenges in climate change and all the other uh, uh, challenges of the 21st century in creating new, better varieties that can take us through the next uh, 50 years of, of, uh, uh, in, 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 um, in the producing countries. We, we, we just, so, so the idea, and, and I, I put this uh, slide kind of together here, kind of, it's what we're trying to do now. We have our tool. We have these, the sensory lexicon, and now the idea is to tie those attributes, not all 108, obviously, to the genetics of the plant, okay? And it can be done. This is a schematic of the uh, approach that we are using. So we start off with... Uh, green coffee and the same coffee roasted. And we run both through a lot of different uh, uh, machines and apparatus to, um, to get out uh, signatures and, 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 and other analysis that at the end of the day that will correlate back to the quality in the cup, all right? So just to kind of fast forward, uh, what, what we're looking for then is the ability to take a sample of green coffee and say, okay, this green coffee has got high quality potential. Move it forward. Advance that coffee. This coffee over here from another genetic line, for example, that we're, we're, we're working with, has poorer uh, quality potential. Leave it behind. And then we start to get at the end, as we come to the final selection of the varieties, we're assured that we've got very high uh, cup quality. And this cup quality is, uh, is essential for uh, uh, going forward as we go into the, um, uh, this period of, uh, of, of a lot of challenges with, with climate change. Because it's, it's just too easy. It will be too easy to kind of revert and go only to a more productive plant, uh, like Robusta, for example, that is resistant and hardy to climate change, temperature changes, things like that. So this is the way that uh, we at WCR are trying to assure a quality uh, future for the, the industry. So, uh, thanks. I'm uh, be glad to take uh, questions. Thanks. Hello. Um, thanks, Tim. I, I'm going to hand over some questions to the audience in a second, but I'd like to jump in if I could first. Uh, I did see the um, lexicon at the SEAA this year. Um, previewed, and if anyone was there, you were you were able to actually um, experiment with the lexicon and, and uh, you know reference it and use a tool, and it is quite amazing. Um, my question is the uh, is it, I guess the scoring part is uh, how will this influence uh, scoring of coffees? Is that still the end goal through changing the will? Will we end up with a score of a coffee, and will that be our reference point, or is the lexicon changing our thinking there? Well, no, the, the, there's two, there are two different things. There's the, the, the utilization of the lexicon by industry, which, is, um, which can be for, you know, uh, uh, training your, your uh, cupping team uh, to calibrate your cupping team more uh, closely 
to identify a, uh, a particular attribute that you must have in a blend or something like that, all right? But this lexicon for us, I mean, in science, is not for scoring. It's, it's for advancing genetic material uh, with high quality potential so that we don't make the mistake of having a highly productive, low quality variety um, uh, in, in the future, which, is, which would be detrimental, actually. Right. Thank you. Uh, to the audience, who, anyone here have a question? Conrad? Tim, um, you spoke about the, the, the narrow uh, breadth of wiggle room with the similarity in the genetic material. And if you had to consider those 180 taste points through traditional m breeding methods, do you believe that you can create the qualities and the diversity or is there a risk of us moving towards gen genetically modified coffee trees? What was the last part? Or is there, do you, is there a chance that we will land up heading towards genetically modified uh, material? No, everything that you can do uh, uh, utilizing genetic engineering for developing genetically modified coffee, okay, which is like gene insertion from one species to another, for example, you can do through uh, classic uh, plant breeding. And so we're, we're choosing the classic plant breeding, with, uh, but using advanced DNA methods to make it go faster. So, but we're not going in and splicing genes. I mean, we are funded by the coffee industry and uh, uh, we're run by the coffee industry. So that's, we've been mandated by the coffee industry to not pursue uh, genetically modified coffee. So you can reach the same endpoints, might take a little bit more time um, uh, using classic breeding methods that you can in genetically modifying the organism. Thank you. Uh, who, who is going to own the intellectual property of the new breeds or the new varieties? The WCR, the industry, is it going to be open? Or are we facing a future in which the coffee grower in a country of origin has to pay royalties for the production of the coffee? That's a good question. And, and you know, I don't, I don't want to duck it, you know, by... Uh, but it, uh, it will depend on the country, actually, where you're actually developing the varieties because the actual intellectual property uh, goes back to the, the, the country um, uh, also, the, where you're creating it, all right? So, but in general, like, let's just take, for example, our program in Central America. We are working with uh, Proma Cafe. I don't know if you know Proma Cafe. It's, it's kind of like a consortium of coffee research institutions in all the Central American uh, countries. So we're working with and through them. So we develop these new hybrids. They will become the property of Proma Cafe and WCR. Our interest is in protecting. We have to protect the property. Then what happens then is, is, is the key point here. Uh, owning something doesn't, you know, is, is one thing, and protecting is uh, one thing too. But making money off of it is another thing. So then what happens, we uh, can uh, license those varieties to seed producers. That's, that's generally the way it goes. So the seed producer multiplies the, uh, the variety uh, to, at commercial scales, creating millions of them that they sell to uh, farmers. That's the way it works. And so you can see the chain coming back. Thank you. Anybody else? So the, inv and the investigation is that only, only going with the Arabica coffees and the Robusta or also with other varieties? Because in Ethiopia, we do, we do know that there is a lot of other varieties than uh, Arabica and Robusta. Yeah, that's a, that's a whole different kind of question. And uh, yes, in Ethiopia, that is the birthplace of the Arabica species. So there's a lot of diversity in Ethiopia. The study that I just talked about in the beginning where we did the largest study ever of genetic diversity in the Arabica species, we utilized 1,000 of those Ethiopian lines, okay, that came from those forests back in the 50s and 60s. They were brought in uh, by FAO and, an, and a French outfit called Orstom back in the day. 
And that's what then they plant, planted them in 15 different locations around the world. One of those locations is in Costa Rica at Catie. And that's what, uh, that's what we used, okay, to do the study with, to say that, oh, we don't have very much genetic diversity to work with. However, that sample is not like representative of all the diversity in Ethiopia, okay? But it is representative of all the Arabica diversity that you can get your hands on because you can't take anything out of Ethiopia. Ethiopia will not let you go in and, uh, 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 or, or, or work with their germplasm. You know, they've been burnt uh, too many times and, and probably, right, you know, they probably have a policy, <laughs> rightfully so, uh, to do that. So they're, they're keeping their genetic diversity there. They're not letting it out. However, back in the 50s and 60s, like I said, a group of scientists went in and took out a thousand of those lines, and those lines are still possible to, to utilize. And so that's what we utilized them. Uh, that's what we did the study on. So uh, in terms of other species, you know, because, you know, there's Robusta, Eugenoides, Liberica. There's a lot of other species that have been, you know, that are grown. Uh, people use them for, uh, you know, drinking. Uh, the, the, the one that's most likely to be used is the one I, I mentioned here, which is Robusta, because uh, it has a lot of just perfect quality traits. And the fact that it is the mother of Arabica means that it's, it's real easy. We know how to, we know how to, to cross uh, the Arabica with the Robusta, okay? Because they're, you know, crossing species is not easy. You know, if you're not using, this is, goes back to, uh, uh, Conrad's question of uh, genetically modified. That's easy, man. You just take out the stuff from um, uh, robust you need and you just splice it into the Arabica. We're not doing that, okay? So that means we have to, uh, to get the gene action, bring the genes together, we've got to actually cross the plants. And we can do that. We can do that between Robusta and Arabica. And the other parent, you know, of Arabica is Eugenoides. So that's another one we're, we're looking at to also integrate diversity, more genes, new stuff into the Arabica uh, coffee species to create varieties. Nope. Is Seni Cafe from Colombia involved in the project? Yes. Ah. Yes, they are. Yeah, they also have one of those collections. Uh, with Seni Cafe, you know, in the whole coffee world, you know, there's Cine Cafe and Brazil, and then it's kind of like the rest uh, in terms of research capacity. So we do work both with uh, Cine Cafe in Brazil, but that the programs are completely different than our programs, for example, with uh, Rwanda or you know even Kenya for that uh, that matter. But yes, so yes, we do have programs with uh, Cine Cafe. Uh, in fact, one of the biggest programs we have right now. Uh, is that they, and this is really important in the coffee world, and I'll mention it, is, you know, before now, I know it's hard to believe, uh, coffee countries have not shared their coffee varieties with other countries. They've never, no one ever ships uh, a, a variety out of Colombia to Brazil or to Central America. You know, that's, that's a no-no. You don't do that. You don't give away what you think is your competitive advantage. So we were able, just because of our neutral platform, the fact that we're, at, uh, we're based at the Borlaug Institute, a Nobel Prize winner for science and green revolution, I think that helped us uh, bring, we brought all these uh, countries together and they agreed to share for the first time their better material with everybody else's better material. So we have a large uh, trial of 35 of the world's best varieties now being grown in Brazil, in Colombia, in Papua New Guinea, every, uh, throughout the producing countries so that we can look and see how those varieties perform in different environments. Uh, as climate change progresses, we can monitor the climate change better because we've got the same genetic material being grown in a scientific way around the world. And we've got other programs too with Cine Cafe and with Brazil. But they're more advanced, you know, they're more advanced. They're, you know, they're, the more advanced programs like in drought tolerance and uh, genetic okay, sequencing DNA stuff. Time for one more question if anybody would like to jump in. Nope. Oh. Here's one. One more. 
Um, as a coffee roaster and a holder of a coffee bar, how can we help? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. Yeah. <laughs> you see that last line there says, your support ensures the future of quality coffee. And it's true. You know, it really is true. There is no other organization like WCR that is uh, an organization uh, uh, made up of coffee companies. We have 50 coffee companies that support WCR to do this kind of work to secure supplies of quality coffee for the future. I mean, it's got to be done. And there's a reason. I'm going to go into the reason why nobody else has done it, but there is a reason for that. Um, and what you can do, you can go to our webpage. There's a place uh, we would love to have uh, uh, your support. And uh, your support, uh, not just monetarily, but a lot of times coffee companies have uh, um, the ability to uh, partner in other ways with WCR that is mutually, mutually uh, beneficial. You know, and it, it could be through maybe you're working with some cooperative in some uh, uh, country and, uh, and you need a special uh, um, uh, technology, could be a variety, could be something else. Well, now you're part of WCR. That should be much, much easier for you. In fact, we could even have a program where that kind of thing is going on. So yes, we, we do. We also have a checkoff fund. Uh, this is mainly for U.S. roasters, but we're trying to get the program into Europe. The checkoff fund is where, as a roaster, when you buy your uh, green coffee from your uh, importer, the importer will take off one half cent for every pound of coffee that you purchase, and that one half cent per pound goes to um, this, this research. And uh, once again, I know this is like third time I mentioned Falcon Coffees is one of our importers. He's uh, Conrad Britz is here with us, and uh, they are participants. They're one of the 15 importer companies that do this uh, for, uh, for WCR, and we thank you for that. Great. Okay, another round of applause for Tim. Thanks very much for talking. Thank you.